We have Harris just ahead in the polls right now. Because after the convention, the party is usually on a little bit of a sugar high, we have that more like 50-50 for election day. So yeah, Harris would love to be, if we could have a snap election in the US, Harris would call one right now, right? She has momentum, but things could change. Hello, and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Christian Guru Murphy. This is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. My guest this week is Nate Silver. Now, Nate became famous, I guess, as the guy whose political predictions and polling analysis we all wanted to read in the US elections around 2008 and then 2012. He was the founder of 538, um, which was a brand that went through various different ownerships and versions, and he has now actually left. Uh, and Nate now uh, does a substack, which is a blog in old money, um, called The Silver Bulletin, in which he still does uh, political analysis and, uh, and, and sort of probability predictions of what's going to happen in the November elections. But he's here because he has written a book called On the Edge, The Art of Risking Everything, which is really a sort of a return to who you were before you were famous for politics, which was which was a gambler, and looking yeah. at people who take risks professionally, I suppose because they are, they are the modern masters of the universe and they are the people who have a huge influence over modern politics. For sure, if you look at the skill set that um, is present in Wall Street or Silicon Valley or Las Vegas, um, A, it's becoming the dominant skill set financially where those are the sectors of the economy, finance and tech that grow as a part of the economy every year. Um, and B, in a data-driven world, that mindset is very important. Um, it's not necessarily the abstract academic version of this. It's, it's actually having skin in the game and taking risk. The physical thing that does to your body, the actual um, you know, reputational risk that you're putting on the line. And so wanting to like, study those people who are kind of my people, so to speak, was the impetus for this book. So, so those people might well be professional gamblers on one part, yeah. or venture capitalists, but might also be those kinds of tech giants, Elon Musk, Peter Thiel, who for is- sure the guy who's pushed J.D. Vance more than anybody else. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so, so this is inherently political as well. For sure. I mean, I, you know, in the book, I talk about the divide between what I call the river, which is this community we've been describing of gambling types, um, and the village, which is the establishment, you know, in the U.S., it's Harvard and the New York Times. The and establishment, the sort of the political the establishment. Media People establishment. call it the cathedral, for example. I call it the village. Um, and that's a more risk averse place. Also, when it's more, the village is more about the community and the good of the whole um, and politics, I suppose, whereas the river is more about individualism, fairly unabashed capitalism in a lot of cases. But that's kind of the skill sets winning out for, for better or for worse. And, and in America, at least, and to some extent here, I suppose, the village is broadly left, liberal. For sure. Um, you know, uh, sort of uh, th think, thinks with not one voice, but, but, but you know, it's sort of more of a homogenous set of values. And the river can be anything. They can be crazy out there on the right. They, there is definitely like a right fringe of the river. I mean, look, the average college educated person in the United States um, is a Democrat probably. So probably you still have more Harris voters and Trump voters. But yeah, people like Peter Thiel and Elon Musk are, are part of the river and are very much on the right fringe. What, why did you want to delve into this world and try to understand them? It's partly a journey of self-discovery. You know, I, like you said, I got into poker and forecasting baseball statistics and building models before I ever got into politics. Um, and I've always felt estranged in the village. Um, you know, I was taught to be, be critical and be skeptical, be willing to make bets on things, don't worry too much about whether you offend person. What matters is that, is that you have the right answer, you're contributing knowledge to the world. Um, and I've seen a lot of groupthink uh, by contrast in the village. Um, you know, they are, have become, I mean, in the US, everything is now divided. Did you get a college degree or not? The more education you have, the more likely you are to be a Democrat. Um, the problem is that I think has led to a lot of partisanship where our institutions are not performing as well as they once did. And so I wanted to have these two groups understand one another better. I want to rein in some of the excesses of the river, but have the village be more entrepreneurial in certain ways and, and less risk averse. And, and is the risk that you focus on essentially financial? For I the mean, most part, there is one chapter where I talk to people who take physical risks. Um, for example, an astronaut, 
the woman who invented um, the COVID mRNA vaccines. She actually had to smuggle money in a teddy bear out of Hungary, out of communist Hungary, and come over and was a real physical risk taker, um, an explorer, an NFL player. Um, it's actually more similar than you would think. I mean, their ability to be calm and collected under pressure is very rare, and that does carry over to poker. You know, poker, if you're playing a hand for thousands of dollars, um, you physically sense that. Your body registers that I'm in a moment right now of, of risk or peril. Um, some people rise to the occasion. They love being in the zone and love feeling the pressure, and some people choke. What, what, what then do you think are the, the key lessons that the village, if you like, can learn from the river? Because, you know, the, the bottom line is when you're running a public institution and you yeah. hear this conversation over and over again, you know, people will say, well, we're not a business. We, we can't just run the odds and say, well, it doesn't matter if we fail, because we're talking about people's lives and, and a state and public services. So in, in the way that an entrepreneur can just say, you know, I'm just going to keep, I'm going to keep throwing money at these different ideas. And if one of them wins big, then it doesn't matter if three or four of them uh, are, are money down the drain. You can't do well, that in what you call the village, can you? You should. I mean, look, so the woman who invented this vaccine, Catalan Carrico, who won the Nobel Prize for it, um, she was repeatedly stymied in academia because it wasn't a safe enough idea. Yeah, if you can develop NRA vaccines, it could save millions of lives, but you want to get your next grant. You want to, like, keep your job as a mid-level bureaucrat working for some university somewhere. And so she had to go to the private sector to develop that idea. And in the past 20 years, in 2006, the U.S. and the, and the U.K. had the same GDP per capita, now you're at 47,000 per capita, we're at 77,000. Now there are downsides to the US. We die earlier, that's a big problem, especially men in the US. Our life expectancy has stagnated. Um, but you know, but running more efficient governments and, and trusting the private sector and looking at expected value and incentives and things like that, I mean, I think we should actually have, you know, pay people more to have good government jobs and compete more with the private sector because the collective is important. So just explain expected value. Right. And what do you think its role should be in decision making? So this is what you get if you simulate the world a thousand times. So in poker, it's very straightforward where there's 52 cards. Imagine how the situation works out if every one of those 52 cards is dealt. Um, in real life, it's more complicated for everyday things like, oh, should I take a taxi or take the tube to the interview? It's kind of an expected value calculation. You might look at the amount of traffic and whether there are delays on the northern line or whatever else. Um, when it comes to really big decisions like, you know, my life choices or my life partner or my career choices, then, then it's more of an abstraction because you only get to simulate the world. We only live once, right? Um, depending on where you want to go theologically, I suppose, at least. Um, but still being able to take risks or when the rewards outweigh the risks is very valuable. Being willing to leave a job for one that is higher upside in terms of your professional fulfillment, in terms of your finances, whatever else, but might be more risky, you know, especially if you're young, that's probably a good idea overall. But how, how, do, you, how do you calculate the probability of things that are infinitely complex, uh, you know, and ascribe a well, number to them in terms of, well, if I'm trying to work out whether I should literally leave this job and go to that job, how do I work out what the number is? It's, you, well, you have to. Here's a, you, you can't avoid making a decision. At the end of the day, a probability is a number between zero and 100. Um, so, you know, one of the things that poker players get good at is being skilled at estimation. They know the really big, important things, and they know the things that are maybe less important and matter around the margin. Um, one problem I think the, the village has is that in bureaucracy, you might worry about about the trivial marginal things, right? Um, in the US, for example, our vaccine distribution scheme had many, many different categories and subcategories based on the political influence of the different groups. In the UK and places, they were like, you know what? Older people are dying more readily because of COVID and are at more risk. Let's just go in inverse order of age, right? Like that was actually a good assumption that the UK made that the US didn't in that case. I mean, because I mean, I wonder whether what you're actually describing is, is the real power struggle that's going on today between politics and big business, where you know, we, we can legitimately ask ourselves who has more power over my life right now? Is, is it the likes of Elon Musk and Peter Thiel? Um, or is it my government? And my government might well be very cautious, very risk averse, very afraid of offending certain groups of voters who then won't elect them, you know, re-elect them in, in four years' time. Whereas these giants of business who are running the things that actually are the things that govern my life every day from my phone to my yeah. car, they just do things. So they don't care. Look, I'm pretty much a capitalist for the most part. Um, 
But the degree to which the 10 richest people in the world get more and more and more wealthy, it doubles every 10 years. I mean, that gets to the point now where Elon Musk has more power than probably half the countries in the United Nations, or maybe half of them combined on some level. Um, and that does seem problematic, potentially. I mean, I guess you see, um, as an American, I'm very pro-free speech. You see now the village fighting back with, you know, Brazil is banning Twitter, and you see Telegraph's president arrested. You see things like that. I object to that, by the way. I, you know, I'm happy that we in the U.S. have a more robust culture of free speech. Um, but you see that there really is a clash not between governments, but between governments and the private sector, if you want to call them. Olig I mean, they mostly are self-made, right? But this oligarchical culture that I think is the increasing axis of conflict. So, so where, where do you think that goes? Um, I think it probably gets worse before <laughs> it gets better. I think we need smart regulation. I hope this book is a way to um, understand, help people in the village understand that, by the way, on balance, technological growth has been very, very good for human society. Um, until the Enlightenment, which started here um, in roughly the late um, 18th century, um, there was no such thing as progress, really. People's lifespans were the same. There was no economic growth. There was no real expansion of rights and the franchise to uh, of voting, for example. Um, and then something happened that sparked growth. And ever since, we've seen you know poverty go radically down in countries like China and India, for example. And lifespans, until recently in the US, so that is a worry, expand. Um, so to get people in the village to understand that, like, yes, growth is good, basically, and improves the human condition, and technology, technology is good, but to rein in the excesses of the river, because there are excesses already. I mean, you see Sam Bankman fried in this book, for example, um, basically stealing $10. He was the crooked banker. Crooked banker, yeah. yeah. Stealing $10 billion, right? And you see the issue of moral hazard and the financial crisis, where people take risks that they're not responsible for. You know, capitalism is very efficient at responding to its incentives. So if you give people an incentive to take risk that we will have to pay the price for, then the system will find a way to incentivize that. Well, I mean, this brings me to sort of whether you think this is is there anything new in this? You know, I think or, or has it always happened? You know, why, why does it feel different now? Why does it feel to be on a different scale? I think it's partly um, the fact that we now have data about everything. You know, when you kind of click the button here in the UK, you have more barriers. When you click the button and say, okay, yeah, I'll go ahead and I'll share my data with you. I mean, that's being used to exploit you potentially, right? Um, you know, when all of a sudden you have a suggestion to follow somebody on social media who your phone overheard you having a conversation with in real life. I mean, things get like, get really eerie. And so, um, so the kind of moneyball notion that like data will help the underdog, I think is the reverse of that is true, right? Data helps the, the hegemon. Data helps the people who have a lot of computing power and AI in particular. You need huge amounts of computing power. And so basically, you know, the four largest US companies plus the government of China will become like even more disproportionately powerful. So we do have to think about this stuff. So what did you learn about the kinds of people who succeed at this? I mean, there's a little sort of, your book has little sort of sub-essays in it. Yeah. And one of them is, you know, is everyone in the river on the spectrum? Yeah. Um, so I, I think you'll definitely meet an above average number of people who would self-diagnose, or I might diagnose as having Asperger's or other, other related conditions to autism. Um, I think it's, you know, I prefer the term neurodivergent because they fit some stereotypes, but not others. So um, people with Asperger's or autism typically are less concerned about social conventions, are less well able to read social conventions, and that can be an advantage if you're in a, founder, a founder of a Silicon Valley company trying to do something different, or if you're trying to start a new um, a political movement, right, and you're maybe not so concerned about, are am I offending people? Um, however, typically people who are autistic want routine and are not very good at dealing with like novelty and risk. So I think what happens is you get people who have this unusual combination like Elon Musk, who has described himself as having Asperger's, where on the one hand, um, he doesn't care about offending people to a point where it's self-destructive at times. It probably is helpful to him on balance. Um, on the other hand, he obviously has like, a crazy, insane tolerance for, for gambling and for risk. And it is literally gambling in his case, right? But I mean, th th there's one thing about sort of, um, you know, the ability to offend people or not care about offending people. The, the, the next level to that question really is about morality, isn't it? And, you know, right and wrong. You know, and does he know the difference between right and wrong? Or does he have such an extreme view of utility and utilitarianism that he's prepared to let people die or, extre you know, experience extreme poverty or, you know, along the way for whatever he thinks the greater good is? I mean, look, I, there's a long critique of utilitarianism in the book, and now I think it's kind of an incomplete 
uh, and potentially even very dangerous moral theory, especially the kind of more short form versions of it. Um, but look, I do think directionally speaking, it's correct to be skeptical of the conventional wisdom. Um, if you go and look at kind of the half-life of a truth, right? Like what people believed 50 years ago about like homosexuality or things like that and how much that has changed, for instance, um, or how much science evolves during the pandemic. In the US, we were told at first, oh, you don't wanna wear masks, they're not very effective, they're for healthcare workers, and then that flip-flops a couple of weeks later. Um, yeah, look, I think I think the village needs to have its conventional wisdom question more. I mean, you know, as someone who identify as, as a liberal, not necessarily on the left, but as a liberal in the way that term is understood in Europe, for example. As um, a libertarian? Or... I wouldn't, a libertarian who supports a generous welfare state and believes a welfare state helps people to take more risk and build society up further. Um, but like, you know, we are the ones who used to be skeptical of the establishment. And I don't like the idea that now conservatives are the only ones who are allowed to get away with being skeptical. Right. So, so, so how do you think this changes or will change our politics and the role of politics? Because the danger is that it makes politics irrelevant. Um, well, look, you know, it just reduces politics to guys who make regulations. Look, in some ways, I wish parties were more strategic about politics. I mean, politics meets the game theory definition, the academic definition of a game, right? You have people who are competing for different resources and they're trying to strategize and trying to adapt to one another. You know, Donald Trump saw shortcomings in, in what Democrats were offering to people and what the establishment of the GOP, like the George Bush era, was offering too. So he kind of staked out new territory. Um, however, you know, how can we have competition but also, also build trust? When you have trust in institutions declining, people do become more selfish and self-interested. You get in the prisoner's dilemma, as we talk about it, from game theory. Um, and so the fact that like in the US now, it is every man and woman for themselves because trust in media, academia, government, the church, um, all going way downhill, like that is bad for the future of the US. And we have those problems also elsewhere in Europe, obviously. And, and so are you, are you saying politics should be more like the river in order to stop the erosion of politics in our I'm lives. saying people, if I were a Democrat, for example, I would want the Democrats to do as much as they can to try to win, not be polite, but try to try to win, right? Um, and that includes adapting to like the media environment. You don't want to tell like outright lies, but I think people in the village are too afraid of offending one another and offending parts of the coalition and not concerned enough about, about winning. Give me an example. Democrats took an awful long time um, to get rid of Joe Biden, and they did. They did make the smart decision in the end, right? Um, but they were like, oh, that's not how it's done, even though clearly Joe Biden was not capable of being an effective president for another four years, was losing the polls to Donald Trump, who has lost a popular vote twice, for example. And they did make the right move in the end, but it took a lot of nudging to do that. Um, and they nearly didn't. And they nearly didn't. And they might have made the wrong decision in their VP pick. Um, one reason why our model has the election as a toss-up now is because Pennsylvania, which is the most important state, the way the math works in the U.S., um, you know, Kamala Harris bypassed Josh Shapiro, very popular governor in Pennsylvania, because of some opposition on the left. And like, you know, I think that might prove to be a mistake too. I, I think you've, you've you've said before that you've ended up voting Democrat in, in most of the elections. You, yeah, you you voted in. I mean, so if you were advising Harris, you know, how can I win the election? What would you say? I think continue to tack to the center. Um, I think I'd say that like, you know, don't worry too much about what like annoying people on Twitter are saying, right? Like people in the, in the US now are uh, Democrats are convinced that like the liberal media is out to get them, which it's not, it's the liberal media. It's for the most part, pretty friendly. It hasn't talked much about Biden's age, for example, since Biden stepped aside. Um, and so, you know, talk to voters in the middle of the country, uh, find ways to motivate younger voters to turn out, um, go after voters who might be a little bit weird. Now Democrats are like phobic about like people who are weird. You know, the RFK Jr. voters um, who he dropped out, his voters mostly have gone to Trump and that's given a little bit of momentum back to Trump in recent days. So don't be, don't be so proud to chase down anybody's vote, right? Anyone who has an open mind, figure out some speech you can give or some policy issue concession that can have them turn out for you. Don't, don't cut yourself off at 51% of the electorate. And, and would you be happy to advise Trump as well? What would you say to him? <laughs> um, I would say kind of common sense stuff. Um, you know, don't talk about Kamala Harris's race <laughs> and things like that. Um, go back in time and replace J.D. Vance. I guess it's kind of too late for that maybe. Um, Obviously, tactically, he's smart, I think, to try to shift to the center on abortion, and Democrats are correct to respond that, like, it's not very credible, necessarily, given the justices that he appointed. Um, 
But look, I think he's... Um, I think he got very surprised when the nominee was changed. He thought Democrats were a cult of personality like Republicans were, and they weren't. Now he's maybe finding his footing a little bit more. I mean, you talk about your model. Let's just talk about that for a moment. I mean, what is it for a start? It's a model that takes polling data from elections dating back to 1936 and sets odds based on them, right? So we all know, you know in the UK, I know in the US, the polls are sometimes wrong. Um, So essentially what it's saying is like, given where the polls stand, then how likely are they to be right? Um, right now, we're in a phase where we're still in an, a middle phase. I mean, our elections are very long compared to yours. Um, we just had the Democratic Convention. Harris would probably win an election if you held it today. Um, but A, it's not today. And B, um, in the U.S., we have a complicated system with the Electoral College. So she's ahead in the popular vote. But like in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, Georgia, the states that probably even your viewers know matter the most in the U.S., it's likely to be very close by Election Day. So not a cop out. Our model has been very close to 50-50 since, since she entered the race. And so you weight each polling organization That's according right. to how accurate you think they've historically been. How accurate they've historically been, their methodological standards, um, and how recent the poll is. Obviously, you want polls from yesterday and not a month ago. And then you somehow, you, you aggregate them and you come up with a figure. We aggregate, I mean, the tricky part is understanding that like different states vote in a way that we call correlated, right? So, um, you know, Michigan and Wisconsin border one another. They're both pretty old and pretty white, right? But, you know, socially moderate. Um, So they'll probably tend to move in the same direction. It's like, you know, Scotland has a big shift toward the SNP or something. So like, so that mathematical modeling gets a little bit more complex than than you might think. Um, In this case, though, it's kind of obvious that it's a close election. We've had close elections in the past in the US. By election day, maybe the model will be a bit more confident if one candidate gets ahead by four or five points. But that's that's far from a safe lead. At the moment, you, you've got Harris just ahead of Trump. It's a little confusing. We have Harris just ahead in the polls right now because after the convention, the party is usually on a little bit of a sugar high. We have that more like 50-50 for election day. So yeah, Harris would love to the, if we could have a snap election in the US, Harris would call one right now, right? She has momentum, but things could change. There's a debate, for example, in a couple of weeks between now and November. Does the polling data suggest then that people are actually changing their minds or is it a difference in Who's prepared to go out and vote? Probably some of both. I mean, enthusiasm had been very low in the Biden-Trump matchup. Um, and now, among Democrats, as close to as, as high as it was during the Obama years in 2008. Oh, right. So, so the Obama coalition appears to have been activated already. I, I think some of it, right? I mean, look, Democrats have lost some of their dominance among, for example, Hispanic American voters um, have become more purple again. There are kind of complicated reasons for that. You know, one thing Trump has been effective at, for better or worse, is building a coalition of the working class um, that are no longer just the white working class, right? Hispanic voters without a college education are plurality. Trump voters, for example, you see that more with like Asian American working class voters. Um, So Democrats have been kind of like paid a price for being the party of the village. Most people in the U.S. do not have college degrees. Um, I think people with college degrees sometimes don't know how to communicate to quote unquote average citizens. You've seen um, obviously a rise in populism um, in many parts of Europe. There's been perhaps less of it here than elsewhere. I mean, one thing about the U.K. It has a, a culture where there's relatively less partisanship than in the U.S., for example. Um, but yes, yeah, so you, you see these shifts and and You know, Harris would love to have the Obama 2008 coalition rebuilt, but it's a little bit harder. Um, You know, younger Americans, too. There have been splits over things like the war in Gaza, for example. Um, So not quite as easy, but, but, you know, she's closer to getting that back than than Biden had been. So so when you're taking those different factors, whether it's the war or black voters and Hispanic voters, and you ascribe them some sort of mathematical value, I mean, how is that not a guess? (laughs) It's simpler than that, which is I'm taking the polls, which I rely on the poll. I'm not a pollster. I rely on the pollsters to take surveys. And of course, you're not equally likely to reach every person in a survey. You'll get a lot. If you call people on the phone, you'll get a lot of old white women, basically, (laughs) and old white men, right, who are sitting by their landline phone and still taking calls. And so there are various um, techniques that pollsters use to weight and massage data in different ways. And my job is to say, how accurate would it actually be in the end and how what are the relationships like between, between different states. But we should be clear, um, any model that you see, maybe except weather models where they're so tested for many years, but like any model involves 
some degree of assumptions, or if you want to call it priors is the fancy term, or guesswork is maybe the more accurate term. Um, you can always make different decisions when you build a model. That's why it's important to be transparent about what you're doing. And don't just let anyone say, oh, I just, I have an oracular model that designed with AI or whatever. And like, no, I mean, like, you know, most models are bad. You know, most academic papers, the findings in those papers can't be replicated again. Um, you know, most people who are going into the casino and thinking they can beat Vegas with some system wind up losing even more money than they expected. So, so you should be skeptical of somebody who says, um, oh, my model is right unless they can explain how it works. Well, I mean, everyone was sort of hanging off your every prediction in 2008 and 2012. Yeah. And then 2016 comes along. Yeah. And it goes differently. The popular, or not, you know, the, the sort of the, the common myth explanation was, well, that was the one Nate Silver got wrong. So, so just explain why that's wrong in your terms. So there are two things. One is we look toward how these are calibrated over the long run, right? So if you have Trump as a 70-30 underdog, you actually, the 30% chance is supposed to happen 30% of the time. If it's supposed to rain 30% of the time, then it, it will rain three out of 10 times. Um, but also I came into politics by way of being a poker player and being and making sports models and things like that and being a gambler. Um, and in gambling or investing, it's where are you relative to the consensus? So in 2016, Leicester City won the Premier League and they were 5,000 to one underdogs going in, right? If I had a model saying they were 50 to one underdogs instead, that's still gonna be wrong 98% of the time, but you would have made millions of pounds betting on that outcome as a long shot outcome. Um, and so because the betting market said, oh, Trump has a 15% chance six to one, and we're three to one or two to one, then, then you know, we were on the right side of the conventional wisdom. And again, I understand that for the village, that's like not how they think about politics, um, but, like, but like, that's how I look at it, right? Like as someone who actually literally would think that actually placing bets on politics is an honorable thing to do. But when it came down to it on tw in 2016, you, you, th you thought yourself Trump would lose. No, I didn't. I thought that there was a 30% chance that Trump would win. Which means that there was a 70% chance that he wouldn't. Yeah, I mean, if I'm rolling a dice, right, I think there's a so one in six chance. So you thought he was more than double Close likely to, double. to lose than to win? Yeah. Uh, you know, at, at but most point. people thought he yeah. had no chance of winning. Yeah. I mean, if I were to invest in Amazon stock early in the lifespan of that and say, yeah, it's a goofy idea. It probably won't work, but I think the market's undervaluing this. Let's buy a few shares, right? Um, is that a bet that Amazon would fail? I mean, I guess technically, but like it's a, it's a good bet relative to the price I'm being offered. What, what effect did that have on your standing you know, with the people you respect? Among the people I respect very little, but among the people I don't respect a lot, I suppose, right? Um, you know, because we actually went out of our way at 538 to explain that this is a very close election, that Hillary Clinton had gotten complacent by not campaigning in states like Michigan and Wisconsin, for example, um, that you know, polling errors of a few points happen all the time. They're pretty routine. They hadn't happened in recent memory. Obama, polls been accurate in 2008 and 2012. Um, but we kind of stuck our neck out and took a lot of criticism to say, this election is a long way from over. It's a close election, could go either way. By the way, Brexit had happened earlier that year. People, you know, Remain had only a tiny half a point lead in the polls. People treated it as being certain when it wasn't. So we had internalized that lesson. Um, but yeah, there was a lot of, I think, shooting the messenger after the fact. But, but look, I mean, I don't, control <laughs> the polls. I don't control how people vote. I don't control things that happen in that campaign, like the FBI director reopening the investigation to Clinton's emails with eight days to go in the campaign. Um, and that's why we have to be probabilistic. I mean, things like, you know, a month ago, a month and a half ago, there was an assassination attempt against former President Trump. Um, if he had ducked his head slightly differently, that would have radically changed American history. Sometimes events that you don't foresee in advance are going to affect things. And that's why you have to think, look, look, look at things in terms of setting odds and not certainties. And, and sometimes things affect things uh, in surprising ways, don't they? I mean, sure. you, you mentioned the, the, the shooting of Donald Trump's ear. And at, at the time that happened, um, I mean, I remember the moment that happened, I turned to my wife and said, well, yeah. that's it. It's a landslide. I mean, yeah, my, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, and even then, even probabilistic Nate <laughs> at that point was like, OK, maybe he's just blessed somehow. He's going to win but, but, but within five or six days, it seemed like the whole news cycle was over and the assassination attempt was irrelevant. And now it doesn't, well, even, it doesn't seem to Well, also think about it had some unpredictable effects, right? So number one, it temporarily put Trump in a big polling lead against Biden, which may have caused two decisions, right? One was picking J.D. Vance, who is not a very good candidate, 
um, in terms of polling, at least. I'm not trying to be, you know, normative here, but like he's not polling very well. And they kind of knew he'd be a mediocre candidate, but thought, hey, look, we're going to win anyway. Let's pick the guy who will cement our legacy and be kind of fun, very MAGA, make America great again candidate. Um, and two, Democrats' polls got so bad for Biden, including their internal polls, that finally they were able to twist his arm enough to force him out, right? So ironically, without that, Trump might have been in better shape, even though it made people more sympathetic to him, understandably, in the short run. So coming back to the question of risk then, I mean, you know, you say effectively this, this election is 50-50. Right now, now what, what effect that normally has on political parties is to, to, to go very, very low risk, you know, to try and tack to the center. So you see Trump trying to distance himself from anti-abortion campaigners within his party. You see um, Kamala Harris uh, being very cautious over Israel. Um, are they doing the wrong thing? You know, should they be more risk taking? Uh, look, I think the evidence shows that, in general, playing for the center of the electorate, especially in a two-party system where you don't have a lot of choice, um, is the positive expected value play. Um, that you want to play for the middle, um, that when you finally build up a larger coal, if you're, you know, if you're running the government in California or something where you're kind of guaranteed to have a Democratic governor, then that's different, right? Then you want to, like, actually pass more progressive policy. But no, I mean, given, given the stakes of the election, I think... Anytime a party is able to credibly tack to the center, um, then that's tack to the center. That's, I think, a, a, a good strategic choice. I just, yeah, positive expected value for those of us who are still getting our heads around the terminology. That, that, that's the right, that's where you want to be. Yeah, and look, and look, Trump has been, I mean, look, he's been inconsistent on abortion, and American voters know that Republican candidates for Congress are likely to try to restrict abortion further. Um, but at least Trump has some type of instinct that, um, look, I used to run a casino, although not very well. It's kind of hard to lose money in the casino business, and Trump managed to do it. Um, but still, he has some instinct for strategy um, that I think, you know, has allowed him to win one election, and now he's 50-50 to win a second one, despite having, you know, lots of deficits in other ways. You, you have a chapter on AI in, in, in the book. I mean, is AI able to do what, what you do with the model, and is it able to do it as well or better? The short answer is no, but the reason's a little bit of a quirk, which is that politics is actually like a small data problem, right? Um, we only have like one election every four years in the US, so maybe we have 20 elections where we have any type of, of reliable scientific polling. Um, 20 is not a very large sample size, so you therefore have to do more guesswork, make more assumptions. Um, it's not the thing like where you can like scan all the text on the internet and predict language models because that's a, much, that's a big data problem. I'm working in a small data area. And, and, and so where do, where, what do you see as the, the likelihood of AI playing out more in, you know, in, in these sort of risky roles? Um, so look, I mean, looking, look, looking at some of the basic facts, um, people in, Silic in Silicon Valley who run these labs, like Sam Altman, say out loud that it could be very risky, but the risk outweighs the reward, or the reward outweighs the risk, right? He thinks that, yeah, maybe it will, like, wind up destroying civilization if it's misaligned with some small percentage probability, but we can, he says, we can cure global poverty and solve all disease, if not, right? Um, you know, I suppose, you know, I'm a little more skeptical of both of those eventualities. I think it'll most likely be more like <clears throat> other technologies that society grows and adapts to, but there are some differences. Um, one is that we don't really understand very much about the inner workings of language models like ChatGPT. Um, they do amazing things, but they kind of are these like magic boxes, and that I think is always very dangerous, right? Whenever you have a model, I want to know how the model works to make sure that you know, as a scientist, the researcher, what you're doing. Um, two is something we talked about a little bit before, but how hegemonic it is, how you need to have lots of powerful computing power um, to make systems that are faster and that are trained for longer on more powerful GPUs. And so it's not Steve Jobs in his parents' garage working on a PC in his backyard, right? It's the already powerful, you know, Meta and Amazon and Google, OpenAI, et cetera, um, Anthropic, and the Chinese government running these models, training these models, and they'll, you know, so that's going to be a winner-take-all market to people who are already winners that kind of defies the traditional logic of Silicon Valley. So, so there is a significant danger that by the time we realize the outcome of the risk, it's too late. Perhaps. I mean, look, there have been some good things. One is that you've seen this kind of plateau in, in LLM, large language model development, where, um, you know, there's been no great leap forward since ChatGPT 3.5 slash 4. There have been minor improvements, but nothing, nothing astounding. Um, 
Also, the community, you know, there is a broad consensus in the community to treat this as a risk that we have to take seriously, to treat it as analogous to pandemics or global warming or nuclear war, which is we don't know that much yet. This is a relatively new field. The progress that's happened in the past 10 years has been astonishing to a lot of people. But, you know, there is a broad consensus among both academics and industry leaders that this is something we have to, and government, that we should think about this carefully and, 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 and you know, and have smarter regulations potentially. Do you think you're making the river sound a bit cooler than it really is? You know, like the gang that we all really want to be part of or really ought to be part of? Um, I mean, if you look at the book, I think it plays a little bit of a, plays this card carefully, so to speak. Um, you'll meet a lot of poker players in the first half of the book who I think are, are admirable characters um, and interesting and fun, right? Um, you know, poker is played for relatively high stakes, but it's not going to dramatically impact society, right? If I lose a poker hand, it won't cause the whole world to be destroyed. Um, and then, but you know, the kind of, the ultimate character in the book is an anti-hero, Sam Bakeman fried who is a Riverian very much. Um, and so, yeah, I, look, I don't, as an author, I believe in, in showing, not telling, right? I don't want to beat you over the head, but though this person's a good person, this person's a bad person. But the fact that, you know, there are nine chapters, three focus on one guy, SBF, who is very much a Riverian and is not treated kindly because he, you know, he stole a lot of money from people. Um, I think that, that, you know, I think it's more nuanced than people might assume. But, but you, you sort of end with a, with a sort of a warning about what the role of politics and humanity should be. Yeah. What is that? Well, look, one comparison you can make between AI and history is in the Industrial Revolution. When we had that happen um, in the late 18th century, excuse me, am I getting that right? Yeah, 1790s roughly. Um, alongside that came political revolution. Um, you had the American Revolution and the French Revolution in particular. You had the European Enlightenment, um, you know, the values of democracy and rule of law and free market economics. Um, if we are in a world, a brave new world, where AI is dominant or oligarchs using AI are dominant, um, that's going to create a huge amount of political upheaval. And the book tries to articulate some values that are shared values that, that we can have if we do wind up in that brave new world. Um, so one, for example, is agency. So I'm a big fan in liberty. I'm kind of quasi-libertarian. Um, but agency means that you have like real choices to make, um, that you're not having a button pressed for you and saying, oh, you can opt out if you want, that you, have, you can have good information, that you have two or more actual exer or, or robust options that you can exercise as a person, that you're not misinformed about them, that you're not coerced into them. Like that's very important. Um, you know, I worry we might be in a very unequal world where, yeah, people who are, are high IQ and well networked and have capital and are not and you know have good health and things like that are in the right social classes can live like giants like never before and and other people are kind of like sorted by the algorithm into into different groups or tents and like they technically have freedom but like actually don't have agency over their lives. And and um, and, and do you think we will have to organize differently in order to get a handle on the way things are right now? We, we might. I mean, I, I think we have to start thinking <laughs> about this stuff. I think we have to start thinking about the fact that, um, you know, we're all depending on information that's like more easily manipulated. Um, however, I'm very wary to move away from traditional values of free speech and liberty and things like that. I mean, you know, that seems pretty dangerous. Again, you know, the fact that we've had in the U.S. especially this long-term decline now for, for 30 or 40 years of trust in institutions. Um, which, because it's not a zero-sum game, right? Um, you know, when you build public infrastructure, for example, or I think even capitalism is not a zero-sum game. It, in, in theory, it should stand to create new technologies that help everybody in the long run. But, but yeah, I, I don't know, you know, I would think about how do we reverse the decline in trust in society? But how, could you just explain, having spoken to a lot of these people, why so many of these sort of tech giants, if you like, seem to think that free speech is under attack? When, when everything about their worlds and the platforms that they own in, oh, in the it, case it's, of, it's under attack. Of, I mean, you had, of, of X are, you had, are all you had, about people saying the most free, often irresponsible, untrue, fake things I mean, you, you without, had, without punity. I mean, I think you see, um, you know, the fact that you have the founder of Telegram arrested, the fact that you have Twitter turned off in Brazil. I mean, those are, those are direct attacks on free speech. Now, you can say they're worthwhile because the benefit outweighs the cost, but they are absolutely a retreat from free speech values. Well, why are they an attack on free speech rather than an attack on 
the business ethics and behavior of those individuals? I mean, I, you know, I have an American understanding of free speech, um, which is that the controversial cases are precisely the cases that need protection, right? If you say, okay, don't say anything that gets you out of line and then you're fine, well, that's not really free speech, right? Um, and, so, and so, yeah, I, I think people need to be able to, you know, take risk with the way they speak because speech does have consequences. That's the whole point. Um, this is part of the risk aversion of the village is being unwilling to, to tolerate speech that can have real consequences and, and can create misinformation. But like that's, that's, the, that's the value. The, the, you know, the value is that we believe in competition and liberty and that, we'll, and that having more information in the world will sort itself out eventually positively. And that when elites get, con, get, get their control speech that they're often wrong, right? You had censorship over things like, um, like you know, the lab leak hypothesis, which is now regarded as a credible theory. I don't know what happened there. Um, like that wasn't very good. In the US you had censorship of, you know, Hunter Biden's laptop, which I couldn't care about, but it turned out that like, that was correct information that was misreported as misinformation. And so I, I think this censorship culture gives rise to too much political partisanship. And, and does that mean you, you in your terms, you, you should just then tolerate the straightforwardly wrong, indefensible and irresponsible such as Musk I'm, tweeting about British I'm, riots. I'm proud to be an American who lives on the you American know. Constitution. I believe that uh, the American Constitution protects those liberties, and I wish the UK were more like the US in that regard. But I mean, in, in that example, say, where, where Musk, Musk was responsible for um, you know, publicizing fake news that possibly inspired violence on the streets of Britain. So is, 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 you know, does free speech have no limits? Um, I believe that the limits imposed by countries like the UK and the, U and the EU are far too on the far too on the side of restrictions. Yeah, but should there be any restrictions in your terms? I think or, it's, a, I think it's a straw man. Just explain that. I think I think we're not debating about the absolute limit. You know, we're talking about like in Brazil. No, I'm, talking, I'm talking about platform. that example. So that example about Musk and the, the UK riots of, uh, a few weeks ago. That should be protected speech, I believe. Yes. That should be protected. Yeah. So he should be allowed to do that, even though it had clearly bad consequences. That's the whole notion of rights. I mean, you were the one who was criticizing me before for utilitarianism, right? And I'm saying, no, I actually believe that morality involves giving individuals liberty and rights and protecting those rights, even if they have harmful consequences. And so if you could change the world in any way, how would you change it? I'm not sure if I'm someone who wants to change the world, right? I want to try to describe the world for as it is. And I think the basic ideas of the enlightenment, including, including you know, individual liberty, including democracy is a very, very important part of this, right? Um, including the free market. Um, and by the way, we've come a long way from then in terms of expanding the franchise to women, to people who are not just white, right? To LGBTQ people and things like that. I think all of that's been pretty good. And I want to take liberalism and adopt it for, for a, you know, a potentially brave new world of technological adaptation. Nate Silver, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you, of course.